on this edition of In the Life. From Amsterdam to the Philippines, from Hong Kong to Brazil. Join In the Life for a special international look at lesbian and gay issues and culture. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Guild Foundation, the Michael Palm Foundation, the New York Community Trust, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of discrimination and prejudice. United Airlines, we're heading in a new direction. And In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life and our first ever international episode. Hi, I'm Catherine Linton. The gay rights movement has gained momentum worldwide from a rise in gay activism in developing countries to progressive new laws being proposed and in some cases passed in the European community. On this episode, we'll bring you personal stories and some very familiar issues that will shed light on the politics, the persecution, but ultimately the progress that gay men and lesbians have made around the globe. We'll take you to places as different as Brazil, Holland, Hong Kong, France, and the Philippines. The case of Beth and Vanji is the first case ever filed in the Philippines by uh, lesbians. But we begin with a young gay rights movement on the other side of the globe. In July of 1997, the world watched as Hong Kong was returned to China after 150 years of British rule. Now, while the mainstream press pondered Hong Kong's economic and ideological future, the gay press questioned the future of a gay rights movement that was not even a decade old. But to understand the direction of this young movement, one must first understand the complex relationship between gay men and lesbians and the two strongest forces in China, communism and culture. in the terms of uh, gay people is that uh, so they do not come out they do they do not even let their family know so they would not shame them in the family people don't talk about uh, don't talk much about the uh, people's you know feeling love or sex When I was 15, I understand myself, I'm gay, but very hard. I, can, I cannot to contact other gay men or lesbians in China because no any information. You do everything for the family, even to sacrifice yourself. That's why gay people, they tend to get married. They're under the family's pressure especially with this one child population, it becomes more important to produce an heir for the family, <laughs> you know. Jenny Lee, Gary Wu, and Wang Yan Hai have devoted much of their work to reconciling being gay with the expectations of Chinese culture and communism, both of which strongly emphasize conformity. Though they have lived most of their lives in China, we caught up with them in the United States, where they were freer to speak their minds. The Chinese culture does not encourage individualism. Most people are still very, very invisible, very, very closeted. People don't have a good understanding of homosexuality. The most important issue is now is let people know what is homosexual information, education. Informing mainland Chinese about homosexuality is important to Gary Wu, who in 1995 was jailed for 13 days after attending meetings where gay issues were discussed. They just said, I cannot say any about gay and lesbian things in China. 
But determined to gather information about gay life for himself and others, Wu produced the first ever documentary on gays in China called Comrades. Though the film shows evidence of increased meeting places for young gays, like a few bars and new Western-style dance clubs, there is still fear, as officials across China can arrest homosexuals under the vague charge of hooliganism, a catch-all term for undesirables. People who has authority, they can blackmail you, they can arrest you. You know, some are even being persecuted. So they can do whatever they feel like to do. Today, gay socializing in bars and parks seems to be more tolerated. But any effort to organize politically is forbidden. A gay movement in China is unthinkable at this time. Chinese government is basically very paranoid about any possibility of social unrest. So anything they think could be getting out of control, they oppose. One thing the government in Beijing has opposed since they took power in 1949 is the free flow of information. With this in mind about communist China, we wondered how gay people in Hong Kong were feeling about the recent takeover and the possibility that progress on their young gay rights movement might be stopped. It is only in the 1990s that Hong Kong began to seriously discuss gay topics. To date, only a handful of gay and lesbian organizations have formed, with most of them focusing on social activities, AIDS, and coming out issues. Horizons, Roddy Shaw is a spokesperson for Horizons, one of the most active of these organizations. Hong Kong is such a hybrid uh, kind of society because uh, there is this uh, influence from Western culture and also this long history of Chinese traditional values which are so much different. Being gay is not easy for people in Hong Kong to come to terms with. So they have this identity problem. We need to develop our own way, our own means to um, build up our community and eventually let the um, let the world know that uh, we are Tongji, we are, we are gays, we are lesbians, we are bisexual people. For gay men and lesbians in Hong Kong, the real challenge in letting the world know they're gay is less about governments or communism and more about the much smaller world of the family. Most of the parents will not understand their children having a different sexual orientation which they have never ever uh, have been talked about or educated about. For the Chinese people, they think that to make their parents unhappy or disappoint them is a big sin. This is the Chinese culture. So what we would like to do now is to help them to understand that homosexuality is not a crime, it's not a sin, they're not doing anything wrong. Just help them to um, build up their personality, their identity first, and then we will talk about the rights later. In Asian communities, I think like family is the most important thing for them. You have to be out to your family first before you can protest on the street because the family is always watching you. For strong cultural reasons, gay and lesbian Chinese around the world all seem to face the same issues. The difference in Hong Kong as opposed to mainland China, at least for now, is access to information. The students can get information about gay and lesbian um, activities on the magazine, and the page is called Campus Rainbow. And more and more secondary school students are using internet and emails, so it's, it's very easy for them to get more access to these information. One thing's clear. Greater access to information and more open discussion of gay issues will lead to change in Hong Kong, and China will be watching. Uh, the whole handover thing has a lot to do with the stability. So I don't think the government would do a lot of suppression of gay groups or anything like that. If Hong Kong progresses, China will progress too. They will influence each other. It's interwoven situation. 
So I think actually Hong Kong can be a good model for mainland people. You can see that we are now um, launching some programs about equal rights for different people with different sexual orientation. And I can see the more general public have got uh, knowledge about gay and lesbian people. Will this hopeful outlook from a young gay student in Hong Kong ever transfer to Gary Wu about his own home city of Beijing? My mom, they're very upset and uh, she asked me, son, if you haven't married, how do you pass your life in China? I answered her, so I can find a very good friend. We can uh, meet family, we can live together. So uh, I do take care of myself. Family and governments aside, what Gary Wu and millions of other gay and lesbian people want in China, and indeed Hong Kong, can possibly be found in one small example, with Yvonne and her girlfriend, Jackie. I'm a little bit different because I live with my girlfriend right now, with her parents and her sister. And because my girlfriend's parents accept her identities from very young, so that's no problem for us. And we live a quite happy life. was just one of Britain's many possessions. As a major colonial power for centuries, Britain's influence was incredibly far-reaching. But in our next segment, correspondent Tanya Barfield tells us about an art exhibit which portrays how Britain itself was influenced by these international exploits. The image of an Anglo-Saxon England devoted to a stiff upper-lipped monarchy is slowly giving way to a different reality. Britain today is a multicultural society with diverse racial and sexual identities. Transforming the Crown, a multimedia exhibit by African, Asian, and Caribbean artists from England, spans the years from 1966 to 1996. And it's an exhibit that challenges what it means to be British. People have this idea of England as uh, the monarchy. That was the reason why I used the crown as an icon, an element of something that conjures visions of the monarchy, because that's what's, mo what's most associated in people's minds with England. Moray Beauchamp Bird, through a vast multimedia exhibit centered at the Caribbean Cultural Center, the Bronx Museum, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, reminded an American audience of Britain's cultural diversity. The iconographies associated with England are not exactly what people think. You know, they're not like a merchant in ivory film. Um, it's not just tea and crumpets. It has to do with a very vibrant culture. British cuisine has changed, the visual arts, the performing arts, literature, all of these things have changed with the arrival of people from Africa, from the Caribbean, from Asia, and that's sort of what I wanted to convey in this show. All of the work chosen for the exhibit explore either sexual, spiritual, or national identity. Art was really for, for a lot of them a forum to look at nationalism, you know, where is my home, you know, where do I belong, you know, is my home in a number of different areas. Although I might have been born in Britain, why is it that I'm questioning whether or not I'm really British? While the question of what it means to be British centered mostly on racial identity, sexual identity was also an important part of the exhibit. It was absolutely necessary to include uh, sexuality with all of these discussions about what makes contemporary Britain um, what it is today. Mm -hmm. 
Including gay, lesbian, and transgender images in a show about contemporary Britain is crucial, argues openly gay filmmaker Isaac Julian, who we caught up with at the film and lecture series entitled Color Screens, programmed in conjunction with Transforming the Crown. Well, I think it's very interesting that this exhibition, um, Transforming the Crown, has this title, because I think, in a way, a lot of the interventions that lesbians and gays have been making who are part of this diasporic um, culture are very at the heart of trying to transform what it means to be British and English. Zami. Black lesbian. Man royal. Kush. Bull dagger. Black lesbian. And I think very much when one's making films, one really thinks of oneself as being British and black, or British, queer and black, and that these films are demonstrations of those identities. Another filmmaker committed to promoting the visibility of gay Asians in Britain is Pratiba Palmer. There were very few Asian women when I first came out. Um, I actually don't remember seeing any at all. But obviously that's changed over the last couple of years especially. Um, I'm delighted to see so many Asian lesbians out on the scene now. It, it gives us this sort of a face and an identity that um, Asian women aren't just stuck at home all day long, married or whatever, that there are Asian lesbians out there and enjoying themselves. Whether through the efforts of filmmakers or curators, the image of the traditional monarchy is being transformed. We're pushing notions of what it means to be British, what it means to be queer, what it means to be black. We're pushing all those questions and trying to make a far more multicultural Britain, which has sort of very different elements in it, which make um, a sense of the nation. Take you next to the Philippines, where a significant lesbian and gay movement has emerged over the past five years. Last summer, that country hosted its second annual gay pride parade, and later this year, Manila hosts the Asian Pacific Islander Lesbian Conference. Now, it may be surprising that a country that is traditionally conservative and overwhelmingly Catholic is at the forefront of this kind of activism, particularly lesbian activism. But in a country where over half the population lives below the poverty line, it's a question of economics or class issues that clue us into this phenomenon. I come from a family of farmers in the north. My family is middle class. My mother was just a cook, so we belonged in the lower income bracket. We spoke to women from different social classes to illustrate the struggles and successes of the emerging lesbian movement in the Philippines. My mother's mother was the first woman lawyer to practice in this country. My father was, I think he was the fourth son of the first Filipino optometrist. So they were kind of like pioneers on both sides. A pioneer in her own right, today Analea Sarabia is one of the most outspoken lesbian activists in the Philippines. The year of the lesbian and gay movement was celebrated. Founder and executive director of Women's Media Circle, Analea produces feminist media. We produce TV programs, radio programs, uh, we publish books, um, we have right now a campaign for uh, women's empowerment, uh, young women's empowerment through the media. I think being middle class, it's still um, less heavier, less harder for me compared to uh, lesbian workers. Or... Jean Enriquez is a single mother and feminist who only three years ago came out as a lesbian. In late 1996, she helped organize the first National Lesbian Rights Conference in the Philippines. 
mas madali for middle class women and I, we learned this from the consultation that we had during the first National Lesbian Rights Conference. So among the professionals, what was striking for me was bakit parang hindi mahirap para sa mga ito maging lesbiana? Uh, may discrimination ba sa pay, sa, sa promotions, sa opportunities for employment? Wal, walang striking examples at all. So it, it must be because of the fact that they're educated so mayroong pagrespeto sa kanila yung mga employer um, because they dress up well, they can present themselves well, yung ganyan. Talagang yung class, um, it, it has power, yung ganyan. Today, Jean works as an advocate for women's rights at a local NGO or non-governmental organization. Well, it's kind of easy for me to be out in my work because I'm working within the NGO circle, you know. Although, some, some men in the, in the movement would still be shocked, you know. Tapos may stereotype, eh, parang napaka-feminine na itsura, tapos lesbian yan, may mga ganyang reaction. Jean and Analea may have some access to power, but women from the lower classes have fewer options. The fact that you are a lesbian, that already limits your employment opportunities. For instance, in local class, either security guard, factory worker, vendor. Of course, when you apply for a corporate job, you have to be in total makeup. So when I was having a hard time, I just applied for a factory job here, and they took me. Up till now, I still work there. Our general manager likes to hire lesbians because she says we don't need to take maternity leave. So the factory saves money. But in my opinion, lesbians can have kids if they wanted to. While lesbians in the Philippines may have different experiences according to their class, there are two things that unite them. The struggle against conservative church values and the struggle for equality under the law. I think one of the uh, primary problems of uh, lesbians and gays in the Philippines is that uh, there is no specific um, protection given to them since there is no law that specifically um, mandates um, people, uh, organizations, institutions to respect uh, sexual preference or sexual orientation of people, then discrimination happens. Perhaps the most famous case of discrimination based on sexual orientation in the Philippines is the case of Beth Lim and Vanjie Castro Nuevo. In 1994, they were fired from their jobs at a human rights organization for having a lesbian relationship. We were recommended to the Women's Legal Bureau. So they took our case on. We talked to the lawyer. We saw that we had a case. We knew that it was wrong, that the termination was illegal. The case of Beth and Banji is the first case ever filed in the Philippines by uh, lesbians that uh, challenges uh, dismissal on the ground of lesbianism. So, For Vanji, the cost of fighting back was high. Her teaching job at a local university was put in jeopardy. I was demoted from being full-time and almost regular back to part-time. So I became demoralized because I'd worked there almost five years. I talked to the university president and he asked me, how are you going to face your students now, given that my sexual identity had been made public? I defended myself, saying that my students were okay with it, that some already knew what had happened, and I explained it to them. But it was useless. It was like I was forced to resign, because why else would they be doing this? So Philippines, and dami daming Catholic schools, so and daming lesbians na pumapasok, grade school, high school, even up to college, sa Catholic school. So yung indoctrination siya. Lesbians grow up thinking that they're sinful, that they're doing something immoral. So it's affected in self-esteem. J.J. Josef is a sociology professor at the University of the Philippines, whose master's thesis, Sexual Identities and Self-Images of Women-Loving Women, is the first study of its kind on lesbians in the Philippines. Isang couple na interview ko, they hardly have sex. Kasi every time daw na nagsasex sila, they feel guilty. Kasi ang statement niya, 
kasalanan ng malaki sa Diyos ang maging tomboy ka. Na hindi ka practicing, hindi ka nakikipag-sex. All the more kung nakikipag-sex ka. So, para bawasan mo yung kasalanan mo, uh, huwag ka na lang mag-sex. Whatever their personal struggle, lesbians of all backgrounds are coming together to organize for equal rights across this country of more than 7,000 islands. If the outcome of the case is favorable, it's not just a victory for us, really. I guess, especially for the lesbian movement in the Philippines, I think it'll help in advancing the gay rights movement, the emerging gay rights movement in the Philippines. The way society looks at us, they disregard us. You know, they call us the third sex. They say we're bad. They say a lot of things. Of course we want to defend ourselves. We want to change how they look at us. We want to stand up for our rights as lesbians. Grassroots organizing, like we saw in the Philippines, is probably the most productive in creating change. But sometimes external pressure is also necessary. From Albania to Argentina, from Zimbabwe to New Zealand, the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission works on both local and global levels to heighten awareness of human rights abuses against sexual minorities and to bring these very important issues to the forefront of the international human rights agenda. Torture in Colombia, imprisonment in Albania, forced psychiatric treatment in the United States. These are just some of the hundreds of cases that are passed through the Eagle Herc office. As a gay man in Zimbabwe, I have no place I have no voice, I have no status, simply because of my sexual orientation. I had been sentenced to an adolescent spent surrounded by white walls and lab coats, quite a punishment for a 14-year-old who is really showing the typical signs of growing up gay in a heterosexual society. The communist era penal code condemned homosexuality with 10 years in prison. Hundreds of persons were cut or turned over by informers imprisoned in terrible conditions of violence and persecution. There is no safe country for queer people. Um, in every, there isn't a country today that doesn't have a very, very important and valid struggle that is going on. An international watchdog for the rights of sexual minorities, Eagle Herc was founded in 1990. Its overworked 12-person staff is everywhere at once, monitoring and documenting abuses, activating its international network of members, and lobbying UN delegates and government leaders. Eagle Herc is important to the human rights movement because it is the one international human rights organization that is focused exclusively on ensuring gays and lesbians the basic rights that they are guaranteed under international human rights law. Eagle Herc's projects vary from assisting grassroots organizations around the world to helping persecuted individuals uproot and find safety. We certainly prioritize um, urgent cases where someone's life is at stake, which is why in terms of documentation dissemination, we've prioritized uh, political asylum cases, for example. The Asylum Project supports asylum claims for people who are experiencing persecution because of their sexual orientation or their HIV status. We deal a lot with, with uh, emergency situations. Uh, sometimes we receive calls from people who are in detention awaiting deportation. We have to mobilize immediately to try to procure that individual, an attorney or someone who would take their case. Recent changes in U.S. immigration law now limit applications for asylum to within one year from the time of entry, rather than the 10 years the law had previously allowed. This presents a huge task for immigration groups to get this information out fast to potential asylum seekers. Of course, there are no signs at the airport that say, you, once you arrive here, you can apply for asylum based on sexual orientation. One person who did receive asylum was Ciprian Cucu, who was jailed for being gay in his home country of Romania. I came to Romania for a 
Marturia. I have come here from Romania to tell this tribunal about what happened to me and to my lover when we were arrested under Article 200 of the Romanian Penal Code, which criminalizes sexual relations between persons of the same sex. Through the persistence of Eagle Herc and others, the situation in Romania is showing signs of progress. Just last month, Human Rights Watch and, and our organization co-published a report on Romania and together did some advocacy in that country. And because of the collaboration, we were able to meet with the president of Romania, who um, announced that he would pardon all of the gay and lesbian prisoners currently in Romania. Before Eagle Herc, cases like Ciprian's may have fallen through the cracks. The kind of documentation work, the kind of basic investigative work that Eagle Herc has done is absolutely essential as a first step toward beginning to bring gays and lesbians from around the world under the protection of international human rights law. Our message to governments, our message to human rights organizations, our message to funders are almost identical. I mean, it is about educating that these issues are legitimate human rights issues, um, looking at some of the subtleties of what that means and, and trying to um, make sure that it's incorporated into the human rights struggle. And that struggle is daunting, but Eagle Herc also takes time out to honor human rights heroes through its annual Felipe de Souza Awards. Uh, we started the Felipe de Souza Awards for uh, basically the same reason that we started the organization, because of all the human rights awards that given, are given out in the world, none of them really um, honor people because of the contributions that they've made towards making the world a safer place for queers. This award has a special meaning for me. It shows that our work is recognized internationally and that we have friends all over the world. It motivates us to work together with people everywhere to create the kind of planet and societies in which all of us are free to live our lives richly and fruitfully, regardless of our sexual orientation, race, gender, or any other status. Thank you. Hello, I'm Yang Hoi. Hello, I'm Deng Yiwan. You're watching In The Light. Still to come on In The Life. Spousal rights, a chance in France for lesbian and gay couples, and Gay Games 98. Athletes prepare for the event of the summer in Amsterdam. But first... We continue our look at gay life around the globe. And our next stop, Brazil. A country known for carnival and carnal knowledge. with its open expressions of sexuality and seemingly anything goes attitude. In fact, many people argue that for gay men and lesbians, this is the most liberal country in all of South America. But Brazil is also a country of contradictions. And behind the ostensible openness to sexual diversity lurks a very dark statistic. A gay person is murdered every three days in Brazil, and other forms of hatred can be felt in aspects of daily life. In this segment, we focus on the real-life conditions for Brazil's sexual minorities and on the issues most important to them. We begin in the country's largest city, Sao Paulo. I think if you say Brazil is a very gay country, it's true. If you say Brazil is a very anti-gay country, it's true also. Although there is a growing gay scene in the larger cities, Brazilians talk about the lack of a political movement. We don't have a background of like a civil movement in Brazil. At the time you were fighting for uh, Af African American rights and gay and lesbian rights and women rights, uh, we were like fighting against dictatorship. A brutal military government in the 1960s and 70s suppressed any signs of opposition. Basically, they installed censorship all over, you know, newspapers, television, and the streets and everything. They were torturing, like, like uh, putting people in jail and torturing and killing them. You know, by that time, that everybody was, like, silenced. 
Eu imagino que os gays americanos eles avançaram muito nas suas I imagine that American gays have advanced, but that it's very connected to a sense of political citizenship, which the United States respects a lot. For Europe, I see it in the same way. In Brazil, this still doesn't exist. The question of citizenship in Brazil is still very weak. No Brasil é uma questão é muito fraca. We have our, our uh, way of uh, being here in Brazil, which is funny. Uh, you can do things if you don't tell. You should not be talking a lot about what you do. Uh, if you were a gay person, you please uh, be, uh, don't have the bad taste of saying it very much. But there is one time of year when things usually kept private seem to be celebrated in public. Every year during the five days of Carnival, gay men flock to Rio de Janeiro. And cross-dressing is part of the fun. Uh, yesterday I went to the, what we call the concentração. The, there were like tons of transvestites, like in very, you know, um, visible position, you know, like, and uh, close to other women, you know, so it was, I was kind of amazed. I didn't, I've never realized that before. Durante o carnaval, há uma maior, há uma maior expressão, uma maior... During carnival, people are more expressive. They're more liberated. It's quite common for men in general, not just gay men, to do drag and have fun in the streets with it. It's a game. But for lesbians, I haven't seen this kind of liberation. We have a three days carnival, you know, and the rest of the year you just, again, be in your place, okay? And during the carnival, even if you are a, a straight man, a straight person, you just can dress as a woman, you can uh, be a sissy. But after the carnival, please forget it. It's very hypocritical. These contradictions in Brazilian culture are brutally evident in the statistics of violence against gay people and transvestites. Pioneering activist Louise Mott compiles an annual report which says that a gay or transgendered person is murdered every three days. Some think the numbers may be even higher. If a uh, homosexual get killed, for instance, it's very common. His family don't want to go to the police because of not wanting his name to be involved in a gay situation. Despite these deterrents to being out and being political, writers and activists are trying to raise civil rights issues in Brazil. Miriam Martinho heads a lesbian organization which has published this quarterly magazine for 11 years now. Here in Brazil, the biggest problem for lesbians is isolation, the lack of space to meet. This is the largest problem, loneliness, where to meet each other. And Nelson, as a magazine editor, wants to generate a society-wide discussion of gay and lesbian culture and politics. The magazine tries to establish this dialogue with the whole society. It is quite different from the line of American and European magazines, where the journalism is aimed only at the gay community. But perhaps the highest profile issues a national domestic partnership bill and homosexuals in the military are being advanced by a straight congresswoman and an exile. After he led an openly gay organization within the Navy, Flavio Alves was dismissed after six and a half years of service. There is a conspiracy of silence around homosexuality. Just pronouncing that word promotes debate. And pronounce it he did. Flavio raised money for this billboard next to a military base that called for gays to enlist. Fearing for his life, Alves sought asylum in the United States and then wrote a book about his experiences. I believe that in the U.S. I am safer than in Brazil, particularly in light of what happened to Carlos Zani Maia, a commander who after years of service was discharged from the armed forces and six months later brutally attacked. So you cannot say that a person or an homosexual here is not in danger. He might be. But if, he's in, if he doesn't provoke 
or he's quiet, but a guy like Flavio that speaks up against repression, he might be in danger, yes. Congresswoman Marta Suplicy has become an unlikely champion of gay rights in Brazil. As a psychoanalyst that had uh, them as patients, uh, and I could see that they didn't want to change their sex orientation. They just want to be treated well. And then uh, when I decided to become a, a federal representative, I thought the only motive to be really at the Congress would be to have, uh, to have the power to pass some laws for affirmative action for women and uh, for sexual minorities. Suplicy has been negotiating a bill through Congress that would provide gays and lesbians with many rights of marriage. She's marshaled enough support to bring it to a vote in the fall of 1998. Well, Marta Suplicy is my candidate for presidency, you know, if she wants. But, uh, and, I, and I know a lot of people that would support her, um, you know, from the gay and lesbian communities. Perhaps what will lead towards more rights for gays and lesbians in Brazil is the combination of political activism with the celebration of sexuality expressed each year at Carnival. Brazilian culture is like um, very sexual liberal in, in a way, you know, it's, I think we don't have like the puritanic tradition, so we are sort of less repressed sexually and that allows a lot of things to happen. From a less organized gay community in South America to one that is more politically active in Europe, we take you next to France, where last year, 300,000 gay men and lesbians took to the streets in a demand for equal rights. Since then, the French government has been considering a progressive domestic partnership law called the Pact of Common Interest, which is a law for everyone, but is of particular interest to gay and lesbian couples. In this segment, we look at how this law is uniquely French and why, for so many people, it is so important. Here in Paris, France, a groundbreaking law called the Social Union Contract, or recently renamed the Pact of Common Interest, may actually be voted on and passed by the end of 1998. The Social Union Contract is a way of legally recognizing couples that is in between two forms of unions which currently exist in France, cohabitation and marriage. The original law was presented before the National Assembly in 1992 when France's government was controlled by a left majority. Last year, when the left won back the majority in Parliament, France's gay and progressive communities realized the bill would have another chance at passage. Before it was elected, the current government took on many issues because they didn't believe they'd actually be elected. The Pact for Common Interest is similar to a marriage contract. It includes taxation, inheritance, social security, and work benefits. The law may or may not give a carte de séjour, the French equivalent of a green card, to a foreign partner. And it does not include parental rights. Je crois pas effectivement que le gouvernement est prêt aujourd'hui à envisager euh, l'accès... I don't think the government is ready for the idea of gay marriage. Most of the politicians who have declared they're in favor of this new law have also come out against the right of gay and lesbian couples to adopt children. To fully understand the struggle to pass the Pact of Common Interest, one needs to understand French culture. France's anti-discrimination laws were written and passed only in the last 20 years. Whether it pertains to race, creed, color, or gender, the traditional notion of the republic does not recognize difference. 
France is not a country that is strongly homophobic, simply a country that doesn't like difference. And we are different. The French notion of the Republic is that we don't recognize minorities nor any other particularities. The French idea of the Republic is that you are French before you are anything else. So this law could not be formulated along the lines of the Swedish law or the Norwegian law, which are specifically marriage laws for gay people, which only address them. Although the French will not design laws specifically for gay people, a strong gay identity has emerged. In the last 15 years, things have changed a lot. We went from having the first gay pride in Paris with only five or 600 people to 300,000 during Euro Pride. I feel like saying there are more gay people. It's not that there were fewer before, but as a result of increased tolerance, we notice gay people more. Holding hands in the street, there are a lot more bars. For example, even if there were some before, you had to know the address. They weren't advertised. There were very few magazines, even general information for gay people. It's becoming more like what I saw in the United States, with gay neighborhoods like the Marais now, where many gay people live, whereas before everything was sort of dispersed all throughout Paris. It's pretty easy. It's not a problem to be open in the streets, in the neighborhood. My girlfriend and I hold hands, we kiss. Honestly, it's not a problem. What's more problematic is my work environment. Because I work in education, I'm not going to be open there. I separate my private life from my professional life. But being open is not enough. Having equal rights and recognition is what many gay men and lesbians here are fighting for. Being recognized by the state would enable me to have access to certain rights, such as the right of transfer. For example, if my job were to transfer me to another part of the country, currently Catherine would not be allowed to be transferred with me. Whereas if we're considered a legal couple, the way married heterosexuals are, she'd be transferred too. Also, I'd like to get married and to be able to officially introduce her to my family as my wife. I think it would make it easier for them to understand our relationship, rather than seeing it just as a friendship or a fling. Je pense qu'ils auraient moins de difficultés à comprendre qu'on forme vraiment un couple uni et que c'est pas juste une, une amitié ou un amour de passage. Si demain, if tomorrow the contract was passed for gay people, I think it would be a step forward because not only gay people would benefit, others would benefit too. Whether you're married to a man or a woman, it should be the same for everybody. Qui vont pouvoir en profiter. Alors effectivement, on peut on peut penser qu'il y a quelque chose qui est en train de changer. Something is changing, and that is, we are starting to feel strong enough to demand our rights as gay people. And we want things to change, and we want these changes to be accompanied by law. We want established institutions to help and to recognize us. And it's in this way that things are changing. There's always a certain amount of fear because we have a fascist party here that represents 15% of the electorate. And that's enormous. So we're saying we can't miss the boat. We have to move now because we have to defend our rights and gain even more. The Pact of Common Interest has finally made it onto Parliament's agenda. And with 70% of the French electorate in favor of this new law, the chance of its passage remains strong. Our final story takes us to France's neighbor to the north, the Netherlands, where gay people already can marry. In January, Holland implemented a law allowing for same-sex couples to register as spouses in a civil marriage. And gay men and lesbians are already eligible to adopt children there. Given these developments, it seems only fitting that in August, Amsterdam will play host to the 1998 Gay Games, the first time the Games are ever held in Europe. In the Life traveled to Holland to speak with both athletes and organizers preparing for this, the largest gay and lesbian cultural event in the world.
we expect 200,000 visitors to come, so it will be well crowded. You know, as Amsterdam is a small city of only 720,000 uh, people. I'm also excited because students of mine uh, are going to, to uh, compete. I had never heard about gay games and what it was. And uh, so first I had to laugh about it and I thought, what's that? The Gay Games 1998 will be the biggest global gay and lesbian event of the 20th century. With 30 sports, a huge cultural program and a lot of festivities. We are expecting uh, 12,500 athletes and 3,000 uh, participants in the cultural program. One of the participants is swimmer Dave de Brown, who lives and trains in a city southeast of Amsterdam called Utrecht. Well, Utrecht is a lovely city. It's small, also with canals and old houses and beautiful buildings. I like the city. And Utrecht boasts a lesbian and gay swim club of over 50 members. Being a member of a gay club has other social aspects, and I meet other people, we have the same interests. I feel comfortable in a regular club, but I think I feel more comfortable in a gay club. Ooh. It's just more fun. I try to specialize myself on the 50-meter butterfly and the 50-meter backstroke. I hate the backstroke, but uh, I'm very good in it, so I think I have to swim that distance. I'm competing in the martial arts division. For these gay games in the martial arts division, we try to make uh, the rules accessible for, for everyone, for all style, all martial arts style. I think Amsterdam is regarded as the most tolerant city of Europe. And I think it's a good uh, possibility to show that to the world and to show it to, to other uh, the gay people that are coming. I started teaching classes. Well, I, I really feel myself a teacher like five, six years now. Enos De Hart competed in the last gay games in New York as a black belt. Her teacher is an American turned Dutch citizen, Wendy Dragonfire. Hey. Enos oh. is the chief instructor of the Amsterdam School, and I'm the head instructor of all of the schools. Wendy serves as this year's co coordinator of the martial arts event. Her passion and commitment comes from her experience at the 1994 Gay Games in New York. When the athletes started marching in, it was all very nice, fun, fun, ha, ha, ha. And then at the end, the team from Saudi Arabia, two people, completely wrapped up, marched in. And they, they marched in completely wrapped up because being gay in Saudi Arabia still gets the death penalty. And I thought, if anyone wonders whether there, there's still a need for the gay games, they should come and see this. I'm, I'm gay and I like sports, so the combination is very logical. Triathlon is my sport. You have to do three things, swimming, running and cycling. I swim two times a week in, uh, in, uh, in a swim club with students. I run two times a week and I cycle two times a week. We are here along the Marathon course. It was also used in the Amsterdam Olympics in 1928, so about 70 years ago. It's a very beautiful course. It's got going to the surroundings of Amsterdam. You will see everything of when you think about Holland, you think about cows, windmill, you will see them, you will have it. And I like competition. I like to compete with other people, not to win, but just to compete, to see how good you are. And I like, I like being outside, sweating in the sun or in the cold. In addition to sporting events, the cultural program, directed by Margareta Lowers, promises to be the most extensive in the history of the gay games. What is really unique, because it's the first time in history of gay games, is that people with a cultural background can become participants. Whether you're amateur or professional, you can take part. The emphasis on culture is spelled out in the theme for this year's gay games, 
a theme that shares a connection with one of Amsterdam's most remarkable monuments. We have here in Amsterdam the Homo Monument, and on that monument is written a sentence of a poem of a quite well-known Dutch poet, Jacob Israel de Haan, and one of the sentences in that poem is, I have such a, a limitless desire for friendship. And we, Gay Games Amsterdam, has taken friendship as our motto, friendship through culture and sports. I think people should come to Amsterdam to be part of this big event, to be together, to have fun together. They will see Holland, gay Holland, how tolerant it is, how you can really live integrated in a gay society. And I hope the openness of the Dutch people, they, they can take home with them. For me, friendship, people together, that's gay games. From all of us at In The Life, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation, additional support provided by the Gill Foundation, the Michael Palm Foundation, the New York Community Trust, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of discrimination and prejudice. United Airlines, we're heading in a new direction. And In the Life members like you.